and we're going to reopen uh, right into our regular scheduled uh, Board of Education meeting. And just to uh, remind anybody who may be joining us tonight virtually, uh, we appreciate you being with us. And should you wish to address the board, just understand that um, we are going to listen to your concerns and questions, and we will get back to you as soon as we possibly can uh, with an answer, but it will not be tonight. So um, that said, uh, Mr. Rush, I'm sorry, who is our... Pam, but it's Pam. But who is, are you filling? I don't in? think Pam's Phil on. Pam? Right, fill in. I'll fill in. So, President McFarland here. Vice President Rausch is here. Secretary Singer has not joined. Right? She's, okay. No, not yet. Treasurer Lauterbach here. Member Baker here. Member Blazy here. Member Hatfield here. Six present. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. We have uh, starting with. Item two, our consent agenda. Uh, we have item 2.1, which is the approval of the minutes from December 21, 2020 regular meeting. Uh, item 2.2, you can see the following staff members have announced their resignation. Uh, those are listed in the consent agenda. Item 2.3 is a recommended employee, uh, Jeremy Utuma, um, for social work and special services. 2.4 is approval of the payment of the school system bills for the month of November 2020 as listed in the check registers prepared by Ms. Holderby in the amount of $8,292,839. The distribution of obligations by fund is included in the documentation uh, which was previously sent to us. Item 2.5 is the approval is, requ approval is requested to authorize legal payments to through law firm in the amount of $5,460, and the breakdown of, of those are listed below. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.5. Support. Motion by Phil, support by John. Any discussion regarding items in the consent agenda? Okay, all Under item 2.5, we had uh, uh, some missing backup from last month by accident. Um, and then that was given to us after the meeting. Uh, we still approved everything, but I had a question in there. There was uh, legal services for uh, a conflict of interest. And I, is that is something we can discuss or is that something that Mike can discuss? I certainly can. It was a, someone questioned the conflict of interest of the Board of, a Board of Education member, and so we sought to make sure that we were in full compliance and there was no conflict of interest according to our um, and recommendation from our legal firm. Okay. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have uh, presentations to the board starting 3.1. We have Mr. Sherrill with Shining Stars. I'm very pleased to announce so one of our January 2021 Shining Stars is Leisha Porter. Ms. Porter joined the MPS team in 2003 as a paraprofessional at East Lawn Elementary School. From 2006 to 2013, Leisha worked with students and staff at Central and Northeast Middle Schools. 2013, Ms. Porter joined the Jefferson team, where she continues today. Ms. Porter was a stakeholder at MPS even before she joined the staff. Alicia graduated from H.H. Dow High School. Alicia was nominated for a shining star by a Jefferson colleague. Among their comments were the following. Alicia has been a paraprofessional for MPS for close to 20 years. For the past eight years, Ms. Porter has put her passion to work with students as a paraprofessional in the Jefferson Cognitive Impaired Program. Alicia embodies the MPS district vision. She gently demands all students, parents, and teachers, and administrators lead with respect, trust, and courage. She, she generally desires an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture. She firmly believes our CI students can achieve success. success. Ms. Porter meets students where they are. Often, she is the person teachers and building leaders look to as they gauge a student's social and emotional needs and quite possibly needed academic sports. She refuses to allow the students she works with to be unseen or unsupported. 
Her advocacy and the love for her CI students is incredibly inspiring. For the past year, Jefferson Middle School has had a student experiencing a difficult situation. Alicia embraced her with all the love and care she had in her. She sees our students and refuses to allow the circumstances or her prejudice to define them. Congratulations, Alicia. Our second shining star of January is Pam Taylor. Ms. Taylor joined the MPS team in 1988 as a third grade teacher at Longview Elementary School. In 1999, Pam moved to Parkdale Elementary, and in 2010, Ms. Taylor moved to Plymouth Elementary, where she continues to teach third grade students. Pam earned her Bachelor of Science degree in Language Arts from Central Michigan University in 1988, and her Master's degree in Teaching Reading from Saginaw Valley State University in 1992. Pam was nominated for a Shining Star by a Plymouth parent. Among their comments were the following. I would like to tell you how awesome of a teacher Ms. Taylor is. My child has had issues at the beginning of the school year, but Ms. Taylor was very understanding, patient, and most of all, caring. It takes a very special person to be as sincere as Ms. Taylor is. As we are scrambling before going into full virtual, Ms. Taylor never missed a beat with making sure my child had everything that she needed, and we never had to wait for anything. Never once did she make me feel that I was a burden at the last minute. I am beside myself impressed with how she handles her virtual class. I sit in one room and work, and my child sits in another. I listen to her session, and it is amazing. Ms. Taylor is so organized and has the kids' full attention for what they are engaged in and what they are doing. Then she has the little 30-minute sessions with the groups that are awesome also. She is definitely a top-notch teacher and deserves to be told and recognized for her outstanding performance. Congratulations, Pam. Congratulations, Pam. Congrats. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, next up, we have item 3.2. This is a DEI update. Ms. Miller Nelson. Good evening, everyone. We do have for you tonight an update about our diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy and the work we've been doing. And Dr. Amy Beasley is here with us. Uh, I just wanted to uh, welcome her, and um, we'll come back to that slide, Amy, <laughs> and to share. Uh, that we're really pleased to announce that we've hired a diversity, equity, and inclusion director, uh, DeAndre Hogan, and that was announced in a special communique last week. Uh, DeAndre apologizes for not being with us tonight, but wanted me to convey that he is so excited uh, to join our Midland School community. If you didn't read, let me just recap that DeAndre comes to us from West Michigan, where he worked as a community school coordinator for Kent School Services Network. And during that time, he was an influential leader on their anti-racism work group. Prior to that, he served as an equity and inclusion coordinator for Grand Rapids Catholic Central High School. He earned a bachelor and master's degree from Grand Valley State University. It is clear through the interview and hiring process that DeAndre understands the important connection between the school and the local community, particularly with work related to uh, equity and inclusion. As I said, he's really excited to come here and provide leadership and support aligned with the strategy that's been developed. And he is particularly excited for uh, him and his family to become part of our school community. We're really fortunate that Dr. Beasley will remain with us uh, through March. So we will have a really uh, well uh, developed transition plan that will be smooth and stable. And DeAndre will be able to uh, assume that leadership role seamlessly. So we look forward to the next opportunity for DeAndre uh, to meet all of you and interact with you. And I'm gonna turn it over to Amy. Great, thank you so much. I um, really just, if we can, advance a couple of slides. There is just a brief update this month, but wanted to take a chance to be with you since my time with you is coming to a close. But we will plan on a much more thorough update in the next month or two to the board to really um, dig a little more deeply into the work that we've accomplished and what is still to be done in the, in the last year and going forward with DeAndre. So just as a brief update to touch on a few key points. So this is a, this is a very high level um, quick look at some things that we're especially committed to for this month. 
first you heard about DeAndre's um, hiring, and he will be joining us starting next week. I am thrilled about his selection, and as Penny said, I think he brings some very important qualities to what we will be doing in the next year. Um, one of the things I am the most excited about with DeAndre is that he has a very different perspective on the way that this work can be done and um, has experiences that will inform that. So he and I will be a very complimentary team. And so I'm excited about him being able to take his own perspective and add that to the work we're doing here. The next is our equity audit. So some folks may have seen a request for proposal that came out this week. I wanna thank Brian Breton for his great work and helping us put that together. But that equity audit request for proposal came from some research that we had done over the last year to identify an, an external party, a firm or a consultancy that could help us achieve an equity audit that was comprehensive. And since we did not find what we were looking for in that time, we decided that casting a wider net was important. So that, that RFP has gone out and I've already received actually a couple of inqu inquiries about that RFP. So we're excited about getting that started soon. Restorative practices. So restorative practices is a natural foundational connection to the equity and inclusion work that we are doing here at MPS. And Jefferson has taken a, a lead role in that restorative practices work and is providing some initial training to teachers that will last throughout the rest of the school year. There is a project team that's been launched to look at our current guidelines and practices. Thank you to Jeff Jaster, who's providing some leadership there to that project team. <clears throat> and they will then be recommending some best practices for us to adopt with both training and our own guidelines and practices going forward. So that model has been initiated and has already, um, I was able to attend the last session, but that has already impacted our teacher community. Our DEI skill sets project team has launched. They um, are a small team, but mighty. And I have appreciated how they have very systematically collected perspectives from around the district to understand the kinds of diversity, equity, and inclusion skills that are important to teach our students and for our staff to adopt. What they have found is that what we're doing with DEI, and as we talked about when we um, worked through the strategy earlier in the year, that it, uh, it aligns beautifully with the IB Learner profile. So that skill sets team is working through how to leverage the IB Learner profile, bring that into the middle school time period, and then help our high school students look at those skills at their, their more developed level. And then the last one is just our curriculum review. This one continues to be, I think we've got curriculum review coming up on the agenda, but this is an ongoing process. We wanted to look at improving that so that we could begin to um, more efficiently bring in curriculum that gives us a more diverse curriculum base. And that project team has developed a review process for our existing curriculum as well. So again, this is just a brief update on what's going on behind the scenes, but you can see that the project teams are um, active and excited, lots of great momentum being uh, created, and I will look forward to a much more comprehensive update next month. Any questions? Yes, sir. Dr. Beasley, can, uh, can we go back just a second to let me talk a little more about Mr. Hogan. Can you tell us a little more about the selection process what you guys were looking for and, and maybe a few characteristics that really are exceptional and, and make him stand out. I will actually defer to Penny because I purposely was not part of the selection process. I okay. helped um, put together the job description and gave some recommendations on the kinds of attributes I would love to see us having a leader here. But then I removed myself from that process. So Penny, if you'll comment. Certainly. Thanks. We actually had a two-round process. The first involved teacher representatives who participated in that initial interview phase where we had five candidates who were uh, interviewed. And let me just back up to say that those five initial were selected based on a criteria that the Human Resources Department set in alignment with the job description. Uh, the job description is...
Okay, we've got everybody back. Mm -hmm. All right, before we were interrupted, uh, Ms. Miller Nelson was giving us a little bit of information about the selection process as it relates to Mr. Hogan. So, uh, Penny, if you sure. could continue, that would be great. Yes, yeah, so as I was noting, the job description was adjusted slightly from Amy's work. Now that we have a strategy in place, what we're really looking for is someone to implement that strategy, uh, to, to put that into action, to be um, out with teachers and administrators and students uh, to make that happen. So we had that at top of mind as we were going through the process. As I said, we did have teacher engagement in the first round, and the second round followed our more typical process with administrators in the HR department selecting uh, the top candidates, uh, which then come to agenda group uh, for discussion and final approval uh, through Mr. Shero. So we really were pleased with uh, particularly the points I mentioned before, his propensity toward community engagement and connection to the school community, uh, his indication that he's very action oriented, and of course his experience doing this work previously uh, was a, a selling point. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Very eye-opening. We appreciate it. Dr. And Beasley, I just wanted to say thank you for your service to our community and to our district and just reflecting on how blessed we are as a district to have Dow in town to, to lend you to us as well. So large thank you to them as well. I will, I will um, thank go you. ahead. I appreciate thank that you. so much. Um, <clears throat> the, I will take some time to pull together words. It has been... <clears throat> It has certainly been some of the best and hardest work I've ever done, and I have been extremely grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, I will say right now that one of the most surprising and gratifying parts of this is to get a front row seat to the incredible leadership, to the amazing teachers, and to the really inspiring students that we have at MPS. We have a lot to be proud of. So look forward to a, a more comprehensive update next month. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Any further discussion on item 3.2? Hi, Pam. Hey, Scott. Okay, let's move on. We've got an action item. This is a Vietnam veteran, Marvin Benchley, to be granted Midland High School diploma with, tw with the 2021 graduating class. Mr. Sherrill. Yeah, uh, quite, quite a ways back, um, the state of Michigan opened up the opportunity through Public Act 181 um, to allow Vietnam and Korean veterans to be honored in this capacity. So we look forward to honoring Marv, um, make sure I say his name, right, Marvin Benchley, and we need a motion for you to do so. Make a motion to approve Mr. Mar Marvin Benchley to be granted a Midland High School diploma with the 2021 graduating class. I second that. Pam Singer. Motion by Phil, supported by Pam. Any discussion? I think this is absolutely wonderful, and I look forward to seeing Marvin uh, get his diploma. Uh, just a big thank you for his service to our country, and um, it, it is one of the highlights when I saw this on the agenda tonight. It, it definitely brought a smile to my face, and um, Marvin, thanks for your service, and we're so uh, excited to get a diploma to you. Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up, we have requests to address the board, and I believe Mr. Hackbarth is waiting to speak to us. Mark, the floor is yours. Yes, I am. Um, thank you, Mark Hackbarth. I have resided in 1910 Westbury Court. In Midland, I have a sophomore in high school. I teach at Jefferson, and I'm the president of the Teachers Union, the Midland City Education Association. And that's why I'm here this evening. Um, at our last MCA Board of Directors meeting, uh, we voted because January School Board Appreciation Month. And if there's any year that the school board needs a lot of appreciation, this would be the year. Um, we voted to recognize our board members by donating a book to each of the school's uh, media centers, starting with the pre-primary all the way up through high school, specifically dealing with the uh, theme of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and specifically focusing on race. And so, 
a lot of the books, especially in elementary and in uh, middle school, are um, biographies. And, and many of them are of people that um, many of us have probably never heard of, such as Philip Freeland. He was the architect of the uh, a Museum of uh, African American History, the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. Or Charles, Charles Albert Tonley, the father of gospel music. Or Bessie Coleman, or Queen Bess, who was a stunt um, airplane pilot in air shows. Um, or Elgin Baylor, which a lot of us have heard of, and how he changed the game of basketball. But there's many more like that. So we figured this would be appropriate for some of the initiatives we're undertaking as a district to help support that. Um, at the high school level, it's a couple of highly recommended fiction novels. In pre-primary is a great read aloud picture book. So again, thank you for all the countless hours you put into this job, the thankless hours, um, and for guiding us through this very difficult time with the pandemic. Um, I think our district's done a tremendous job through all of this, and, and I assume we're going to continue to do so. Thank you, thank you again for all for your service to the community. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate that. Uh, very kind words, and, and our appreciation is mutual. Um, for all the teachers and all the staff and it's just a big collective effort to to just really get through and take care of our kids so it's been a a wonderfully trying endeavor um, but I think we're going to come out ahead and I think we're we're definitely on the right path so I am proud to be part of this team and I know everybody else is as well so thank you so much for joining us tonight okay um, let's move on. We've got an action item, item 5.1 under CIA. Oh, I'm sorry, we have, do we have minutes? No. No minutes? Guys, CIA? Nope. nope. No, no minutes. minutes. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, we have item 5.1. This is an action item, textbook adoption. Uh, Ms. Miller Nelson. Good evening again. We do have for your action tonight the textbook that was brought to you for information at the last meeting. This text titled English Language and Literature for the IB Diploma Program uh, by publisher Hodder it will be used in 11th and 12th grade in our IB Language and Lit 1 and 2 classes. Uh, so this is here uh, for your approval. One clarification I do want to make is uh, pending your approval, this will be purchased immediately for use semester two. Okay, thank you. I'll accept the motion. Move to approve item 5.1, the adoption of the textbook uh, that Penny just um, presented to us. Okay. Support. Motion by Pam, support by Lynn. Any discussion regarding item 5.1? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Next up, item 5.2, we have another action item. This is a major change proposal. We do. Again, at the last board meeting, the series of major change proposals were presented for your information. These include web design and advanced web design name course change, Mandarin Chinese point two and point three being additional courses that we'll add, adding a point three accelerated option for welding, building trades, and woodworking, uh, taking a look at our science curriculum grades 3-5 and considering alignment between Serial City Science, Project Lead the Way, and making adjustments as needed. And finally, the elementary literacy curriculum adoption. The cost of these proposals, including all related expenses, such as the curriculum development, staff development, student and staff materials, are included in the proposals. Uh, expenses for the total implementation are described again in each of those documents and are available if needed in my office. Uh, these will be pending final budget approval of next year's uh, fiscal budget. So these are here for your consideration. Okay. Thank you very much I, and I will accept the motion. I move to approve item 5.2 major change proposals um, that were presented by Penny just seconds ago. Support. support. Motion by Pam, support by John. Any discussion in addition, any additional discussion regarding item 5.2? It's just really exciting to see the STEM classes um, pick up a point three option to recognize the students and their great work and, and setting themselves apart. So I'm excited. 
Absolutely. I think these change proposals are wonderful and considering everything that um, the, our district is, is going through and still able to bring forth these uh, proposals, uh, depending on our, our budget for next year, I, I think it's a fantastic job by our administrators and teachers um, to vet these and bring them forward. I'm looking forward to uh, implementing them at Midland Public. Okay. Great comments. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Miller Nelson and Mr. Jaster with our COVID 19 reconfirmation. We'll need just a minute to get these slides up. Okay. These are looking familiar to you by now, uh, as it's the same template we use every month. So we will uh, cruise through these for you. Again, uh, the first indicator is whether there have been any modifications to the actual extended COVID-19 learning plan. And we're reporting no changes, but offering the update, of course, that our DK through 8 students are back in person uh, learning. And uh, we are really excited to welcome back our high school students. Uh, here next week. Penny, I'm not seeing the slides. Are we sharing those? Uh, just one moment, please. Are we good? Great, Are you all set, thanks. Pam? Okay. This slide has not changed since we first presented this to you back in the fall. This simply represents the percent enrollment that we have uh, in 100% remote learning and those who are not 100% uh, remote. Next month, you will see an update to this as we have welcomed back uh, many students to the in-person learning option. So look forward to sharing that data next month. We are also, if you remember, required to share with you a summary of public comments. We have received comments from parents and families advocating for high school students to return back face-to-face -face learning sooner than semester break January 19th. We have received uh, feedback from parents and families concerned about students returning face-to-face -face after winter break, particularly noting uh, concerns around families traveling uh, and the p potential of uh, spreading COVID. And finally, we have parents questioning whether the Gator-style mask could be worn by stu students. I'll remind you, we're obligated simply to report out the comments we receive. They continue to be both uh, accolades for the work we're doing along with criticism, which um, I'm sure will uh, mm -hmm. continue to be our trend. Uh, we're looking forward, however, to, to getting students back face to face uh, and having everyone together again. Uh, the last piece we have is the update on our two-way interaction rates. Thanks, Penny. Um, just a reminder, the percentages in the table uh, represent the percent of students who have met the minimum of two two-way interactions for each week. And it's worth noting that we've only had seven school days since our last um, Board of Ed meeting in December. So uh, that first, the first row was just Monday and Tuesday, the week of December 21st. So 84% of students, um, all students, met that requirement, the minimum requirement, 100% remote. We had 69%. And then the not 100% remote group was 90. Last week, our first week back in the new year, all students uh, meeting the, at least two two-way interactions were 90%. Those that were 100% remote, 72%, and then 86% for those not 100% remote. So you need, do need to take action on it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. All right. I will at this time accept the motion to... Um, approve the COVID-19 reconfirmation. So moved. Support. I'm sorry, <clears throat> who, who? Oh, John. John. Okay. Yeah. Mo uh, motion by John, support by Phil. Any discussion regarding item 5.3? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Next up, we have item 6.1. This is under FFO. And these are going to be our study committee minutes from John. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I, I just wanted to point out, I just noticed the agenda says that it identifies me as the chair of FFO. 
and I thought, I mean, I'm happy to read the minutes, but I just, I hadn't noticed that in the agenda, and I thought that we named Scott. Yeah, so this would, re- this would reflect as of uh, prior to the meeting, which I believe, if we had it right, you were chair of last year. I, I wasn't. I was not at FFO okay. last year. That's okay. I, I just. We'll get it. Mary Friedel was uh, the right. chair last year. Yeah, no. Right. Yep. Okay. Uh, the uh, FFO committee met on January 4th of 2021. Uh, we reviewed the November financials. The November 2020 expenditures were up in comparison to November 2019. This is largely due to the first stipend payment to teaching staff for their contribution to the return to learn plan and other COVID-19 related expenditures. We reviewed the high school bond work uh, information, financial information pertaining to the Barton Mallow presentation at the November Board of Education meeting was reviewed. Research, including a review of the meeting recording and provided presentation concluded that the information presented pertaining to bond work at the high schools during the meeting by Barton Mello was accurate. Supporting documentation is attached to these minutes. Budget amendment. The first of two scheduled budget amendments was presented to the committee. This amendment reflected updated enrollment numbers, state aid modifications, and COVID-19 related revenue and expenditure adjustments. The second amendment will occur in early June. Guaranteed Savings Program Energy Project. Bids were discussed with the committee. A recommendation for award of the project will be brought to the January Board of Education meeting. Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Progress on the hiring process of the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion was shared. An introduction is planned for the January Board of Education meeting. Committee will next meet on February 1st at 5 p.m. All right, thanks, John. Uh, next up, we have item 6.2. This is an action item. It's the budget amendment. Brian. Yep. Thank you, Ms. McFarland. Just a second, and we'll get the presentation up and queued. Thank you, Megan. Appreciate that. So tonight, we bring you the first amendment of the fiscal year budget. And before we get into the actual information, I'd like to give gratitude to where it's due. Um, We are actually technically out of timeline according to what our norms are. Our more seasoned board members will know that tradition is we typically do our first budget amendment in March and we do our second budget amendment in June. And for the past two years, due to the volatility of the funding at the state level and the passing timeline of those budgets, we'd we'd have to move those up because it is a much more substantial change from what our norm is. And the work that was done by our business office, specifically Lori Holderby and John McClellan, is of note, and also the work of our directors and our administrative assistants and office professionals, specifically for this budget amendment, is of worthy note because of the large, substantial changes that happened from our initial predictions to where we are today. So they are worthy of credit, and I certainly appreciate all their work on this. So tonight we present you our first budget amendment for the year. We are already in a duplicative cycle where we are working hard behind the scenes on our 21-22 budget. We're working on projections for enrollment. We're monitoring state budgets, which really kicks off this Friday with the Consensus Revenue Estimating Conference. We're already starting to take a look at staffing levels and put all of those initial projections in place, especially because they help us inform our contract negotiations, which will commence here within a couple of weeks. Um, We will bring to you at the beginning of June the second budget amendment where we will refine these numbers once more after we've gone through four or five more months of action within the school district operations. And finally, on the 21st of June, we'll bring you the final amendment um, to this budget and also the action item to approve our next fiscal year's budget as well. I mentioned in my opening that this is one of the more substantial budget adjustments that we've ever done. If you remember me speaking last June, we really were trying to guess during one of the most tumultuous times, tumultuous times in education, what our funding levels would be and what our enrollment predictions would be as well too. So this budget was impacted primarily by several bullets that I'm gonna go through here for you. First, uh, our student enrollment. And actually, we guessed pretty close on student enrollment, and I'd like to say that was by skill, but actually it was by a legislative act that put us as accurate as we thought that we were. We budgeted for 7,666 students, and our blended count we are predicting is gonna come in at 7,660 students. Again, 
I said that's more because of a legislative action. Note that we are actually around 308 students down from the spring, but the legislature, as a part of their budget, flipped how they do their traditional student blend count. Traditionally, it's 90% of this fall count and 10% of the previous spring's count. And this year, because they knew that districts would need enrollment protection because of the pandemic and the large number of students that were choosing to do different modes of education, they are counting 75% of last spring and 25% of this fall, which puts us at that number of 7660. We are gonna have to pay very close attention to our enrollment, our re-recruitment efforts, and what the state decides to do with their count moving into the future. And that's something we'll talk a lot more in April about when we get to our budget workshop, and I'll really flush through those details for you. Um, so in terms of that flux, that was only around six students, so it wasn't a major swing. What was the biggest single impact on this budget was the volatility and timing in the state funding information. We predicted a worst case scenario for you in June, just to be cautious in building our original numbers. And that worst case scenario was a $750 per student cut, cut and a very substantial cut in our categoricals as well, which is things like our special education funding, um, our retirement funding as well too. So we were very, very happy when the state um, gave us a funding level that was par, um, no cut to our per pupil funding, and most of our categoricals were par as well too. The COVID related grants and corresponding expenditures really has been a challenge for us. The COVID revenues have come to us in multiple different streams over time. It wasn't just one amount of money that they gave us. There really are three or four different streams of money that came to us at different times all with different rules and regulations to them. So we've had um, a difficult time in tracking them, but we again have a very talented team behind the scenes that's been able to flush those out and make sure that we're relating the expenditures to the revenues. The expenditures as well has been something for us to track and predict. Um, it is largely aligned to the stipends that we are paying to staff to not only help us with our return to learn plan, but also to help us implement our remote learning through our own internal MPS teachers, but also our vendors as well too. And I have some slides that will detail those down and show you the breakdown of our COVID related expenditures. And then your last two bullet points are typical. We're constantly chasing what our state and local, local revenue factors are gonna be. When we pass our budgets in June, we are predicting what we think our property values are gonna be. And sometimes those property values come in higher or lower, which will then impact how our state funding is given to us through two different lines called 22A and 22B, which I'll detail in the next slide for you. So in terms of revenue changes, we have a total general fund revenue anticipation number of around $12.48 million, which is a very substantial change in revenue from where we were before. As I stated in the previous slide, our biggest line in funding change was what we call 22B, which reflects us amending away that $750 per pupil cut. The state also gave us a one-time addition of $65 per student. They did not add that into the foundation allowance because they wanted to be cautious about their revenues for the future. Um, so that is also an added bonus as well. That line itself, eliminating that cut, gave us around $6.34 million in added revenues. I addressed previously briefly our COVID-19 grants. They're made up of multiple lines, 11P, ESSER, 1032, also some monies that came in from the Midland Area Community Foundation. And we have just short of $3.5 million that came in that are solely dedicated to offsetting some of our COVID-19 expenses. The 147 lines are directly related to our retirement costs and those offsets. Those came in a million dollars higher than expected. 51 C and F are our special ed cost reimbursement lines. That's around $820,000 in additional revenues. Our Title 1A, 2A, 1D, and 4A are all federal grants that come to us. Um, those are costs, those are revenues that have direct costs associated with them. So those revenues come in and they have direct expenditures that are built to them in the budget. And those came in at around $735,000. Our 31A monies are dedicated to our at-risk students. As with the federal grants, those have direct cost offsets to them as well. 31N6 
is also related to supporting students with student mental health supports, around $380,000. Section 24 is for our court appointed students. And then finally, we have a negative revenue adjustment in lines 22A, 26A, and also athletic revenues. Um, just to spend a second there, athletic revenues, it should be no shock to anyone that those are lower than anticipated with the restrictions for attendance. 26A is the reimbursement that we get from the state for our renaissance zones. We have several renaissance zones here in Midland, and those are starting to fall off. Those are only tax breaks for certain periods of time, and then they fall off over time, and there's certain portions of that that comes to MPS um, that has to be reimbursed by the state. And then finally, 22A, this doesn't really reflect a decrease in the amount of money the state um, is giving us per pupil. It has to do with the blend of how much our 18 mil non-homestead property tax is going to give us in relation to what the state has to fund us per pupil. Our property taxes, those revenues are going to come in higher than we anticipated, which means that the state's obligation of the $8,651 per student is less than what we had previously sent previously anticipated. So in the end, again, a total general fund revenue adjustment increase of $12.483 million. On the expenditure side, it's actually a little bit simpler to be able to break those down for you. We have three main categories of expenditures um, that represent an expenditure increase in our budget of $7.78 million. The first and most substantial is our COVID-19 related expenditures. We've now lived with our COVID-19 return to learn plan for about half of a year. And this number is our estimate of what our full year cost for COVID-19 will be at about $5.86 million. In two slides here, I'll show you a detailed breakdown of what we anticipate those expenses to look like. The next two are our state grants and our federal grants. Um, the R next to those in this means that there is a direct revenue offset to this. So this is money that comes in and money that goes out. Um, 31A is at risk and six is our student mental health supports. 35A5 is our literacy grants and 147C is our retirement offset. And the federal grants I talked about on the previous slide as well too. So when you combine those three categories together, about $7.78 million in increases in expenditures. And if you're looking at a breakdown of that to a percentage correlation of that $7.78 million, about three quarters of that is directly associated to the COVID-19 plan. There were not many expenditures that were outside of that that didn't have direct cost offsets, um, as is such with our federal grants and our state grants. As noted, because it was such a significant impact on this budget adjustment, I want to spend a little bit of time flushing out our COVID-19 expenditures, um, just a little bit more detail for the board and for the public. Um, at this time, we are predicting that our COVID-19 costs are going to be around the $5.9 million mark for the school year. Um, when combined with the COVID grant offsets of about 3.5 million, we are predicting that this is gonna cost the Midland Public Schools about $2.37 million of our general fund. Um, if I can reflect you all the way back to June, we did say um, at that time that there was no better reason to have a rainy day fund than the current pandemic that we're in. And we are truly, truly blessed that we have a general fund balance to be able to help us offset some of these impacts. We are definitely um, offering a COVID-19 plan that has um, robust supports for our teachers and for our students. And so we are ensuring that we are putting our money where our mouth is and providing those supports the best that we can. To break it down a little bit further for you for our COVID-19 expenses, um, of that increase in expenditures of $5.86 million, the most significant increase is our staffing. Um, we did not reduce staffing over the summer. We actually added staffing, 18 staff members total, 13 teachers largely at the elementary level, and five electronic learning facilitators of about $1.49 million. Um, for our MPS staff, for our return to learn stipends, that's gonna be around a million dollars. Um, vendor virtual learning and MPS staff virtual learning combined together was about $1.2 million. Personal protective equipment was $575,000. We're anticipating that the staff lunch coverage is gonna be around $450,000. And then you see in the cascading there, our technology that we had to add in between software and hardware is around 447,000. 
Um, contracted services, which includes our increased cleaning in the building with EnviroClean is around 270,000. And then we had miscellaneous items, including summer learning salaries as well to, to help with the enhancement and remediation. Um, it is relevant to note um, that approximately 63% or $3.7 million of these expenditures are going directly to the MPS staff members and teachers, something that we think that they deserve for the efforts um, that they've put into helping provide the supports for our students. So when you boil all of those numbers down, this slide will give you an impact of what that has done from our original budget to what our revised budget is. Approximately, as I said before, a $12.4 million increase in revenues. Um, when you couple that with a $7.8 million increase in expenditures, that will reduce our anticipated budget deficit from $9.4 million to $4.7 million, which is a very significant, almost $5 million reduction in the anticipated deficit um, at the conclusion of this budget year. When you couple that with an estimated budget variance of 1.5%, which we believe um, is a conservative estimate at this time, we think that at the end of the year, if these numbers hold true, that there will be a budget shortfall of around $3.3 million. Um, that would leave us with an anticipated unassigned fund balance of around $16.8 million or 17.9%. Um, I do want to pause there just for a second. Um, I know that a lot of people will measure the health of a school district's budget based on their percentage of general fund balance. And I want to caution people that in this year, that percentage is something that is heavily influenced by our increases in expenditures. Those that um, like to play around with mathematics know that if you increase a denominator um, and you keep the divisor the same, that that percentage will often change. If I would have brought you tonight a budget that was at zero flat or did not at all dip into our fund balance, just because of the amount of expenditure increase, our general fund balance percentage would have changed from 30.1% to 26% just because our general fund budgeted expenditures increased to $94 million in this odd pandemic where you have such an increase of expenditures that's kind of a bubble in time. Just for comparison, last year, our audited expenditures were around $81 million. So we expect this year to be a kind of a blip in what our typical budget process looks like for expenditures, and we expect to see more normal growth as we move into next fiscal year. So as we move into looking ahead what our key budget drivers are going to be for next year, um, we are going to be doing reviews with our departments. We are going to be um, continuing to look at what our COVID-19 related revenues and expenditures are, and we're gonna to continue to watch our audited enrollment numbers. There's a lot of factors that come into play into us developing our second budget amendment and also our next fiscal year's budget as well too. We do not expect um, a normal cycle to commence. We will probably not know what our per pupil funding is going into June, but I hope that we're pleasantly surprised and we have a clearer picture after the revenue conference comes out um, that we're getting kind of good at estimating and then doing these budget adjustments to bring it into much more cleaner alignment um, for us to get a clearer picture of where our finances are. Um, so with that, um, we would appreciate if the Board of Education would approve our budget amendment this evening. And again, we will continue to watch these numbers as time comes on and amend this one more time for much cleaner numbers um, toward the June month. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Uh, with that, I will accept the motion. Make a motion to approve the budget amendment as presented by Mr. Brute. I'll support that, Pam Singer. Okay, motion by Phil, support by Pam. Any further discussion regarding item 6.2? Scott, I have a few things. Of course. Um, one thing I'm thinking about is the general fund balance and just keeping in mind as we move into thinking about next year and setting ourselves up uh, for success and, and making sure that when we're making decisions about next year, we make sure that, that we have a, uh, a fund balance that can continue to get us through. I feel so grateful this year that our state funding and our federal funding and our, and our local foundations have helped, helped us uh, and put us in a good position. Um, 
but next year we know that we're going to take a hit on um, per pupil funding and that, and it's just important that uh, we maintain a, a good fund balance as, as well. I think we all agree with you 100%, and Brian and his team um, are doing a fantastic job, in my opinion, and I, I think I can speak for the entire board. This is incredibly complex, and it's try, like trying to hit a moving target, and you guys have been spot on thus far, and this is a, a very important oh, your mic's not on. This is a very encouraging amendment. Um, I don't know if any of what I just said got on, but um, anyways, to go circle back, Pam, we agree <laughs> with you 100%. Um, Brian and his team have, have done a fantastic job, uh, I think, looking to the future and estimating and predicting and, and trying to hit what is now a, a rapidly moving target. Uh, and they've done just a, a wonderful job. So, um, yeah, that, we agree with your, with your comments uh, 100%, Pam. Thank you. I guess the other thing I want to add is just um, a, a big uh, a piece of appreciation for the amount of extra work uh, this year because of COVID and because of, you know, all the changes that have been come, they're coming so quickly at our financial uh, department with Lori Holderby and John and and um, just being able to understand all the rules, different rules for, for different funds that were available and a lot of hoops to go through to have access to those funds. And I know um, their plates are already full, so when something like this happens, it, uh, I'm sure they were just working uh, uh, lots of extra hours to set us up for success. So a big thank you. To the, to the financial financial folks. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. Next up, item 6.3, we have another action item. This is the Energy Savings Program Award. Mr. Bruton. Thank you, Mr. McFarland. Um, actually, tonight is about a culmination of almost a year's work that we've been doing um, on this project. Know that Mr. Sherrill has been um, keeping you updated and briefed you, um, and we also entertained a presentation on this many months back from the firm that we're going to be recommending for award tonight. Um, but in summary, uh, what we are seeking your approval for tonight is a guaranteed savings program energy project. And to give you the abstract of a very, very comprehensive proposal, what this is is a program that is going to um, replace our lighting in the district wide with LED lights. It's also going to replace the HVAC at the administration center, which is reached end of life, which will allow us to be able to complete our demolition of the building next door to help increase the energy efficiency here and really, really help us save dollars on the end. And the philosophy of an energy savings program is that the savings that you have annually will help you make the payments for the amount that you need to finance to be able to do the project. And so you have seen in your motion that the project costs are estimated to be $3,875,786, of which we will have to finance $3.875 million of that. And we seek tonight your approval to be able to seek that financing and also to enter a contract with SiteLogic um, we did bid this project. We were blessed to have three bidders um, that were very competitive, um, SiteLogic, Brewer Garrett, and Train. And through a very comprehensive vetting project, we are recommending that your approval this evening will allow us to enter a contract with SiteLogic to be able to help us to execute this energy project. Um, so there is a comprehensive resolution that's presented to you that will allow us to be able to enter that contract talks with SiteLogic and also to start the process of seeking the financing for this project as well too. For general timeline purposes, um, if your approval is given to us this evening, we will start the process of entering those contract negotiations and working with our financial advisors to be able to seek that funding. Um, we would like to be able to get moving on this project um, very quickly. We will have a little bit of abatement to do in this building, and we will have to completely move 
our staff out of this building later on this spring so that the carpet can be replaced. That's a separate project in itself. And so that we can replace the HVAC system in here as well. And your approval this evening will let us get the ball rolling. So hopefully we can get this project started in the April, May timeframe. All right. Thank you very much, Brian. Yes, sir. Okay. I will accept the motion for item 6.3. Make a motion. Oh. John. Mm -hmm. Support. Okay, thank you. Uh, motion by John, support by Phil. Any further discussion for item 6.3? I would it, just like to say that... Um, it's, go ahead. Hi, Scott. I have a series of questions for you on this uh, particular item. Um, the Guaranteed Savings Agreement, uh, as Brian described, um, that leads one to believe that it's self-funded. Is that what you are looking to, or is that your goal of the program, to be self-funded? Yeah, the, the guaranteed savings um, from the proposal that we are recommending we accept from SiteLogic is um, a guarantee of savings in its $202,164 per year. That's guaranteed for the first five years. And the company does provide you with a cash flow um, prediction chart, and I believe SiteLogic made that out to 20 years. At the end of our financing term, which is going to be in the 15-year range, it was our goal to have this as a zero net cost to the district at the end of this um, project. So yes, it does move us to being close to that zero net at the end of 15 years. And if you move it out to 20, it actually shows savings to the district um, in that end of the 20-year term that's there. So but yes, Mr. Blazy, it is in term at the end of a 15-year project, um, zero net. But the guarantee, Brad, is the annual savings. And so the liability to the energy company is to make up, if you look at the documentation, the difference between if that doesn't occur. Okay. So in their form for alternate number three, which you're looking to get approval for today, um, their total annual costs, including their uh, principal and interest, and also the measuring and verification cost, comes to four million five hundred and sixty-six thousand two hundred and seventy-three dollars. And then over the duration, that's over the fifteen years. And then this starts out a little bit with a cash, uh, positive cash flow, and then. In year four, it goes negative cash flow, and it is negative compounding to be even more and more negative in the cash flow as we go through all 15 years. So we close out at end of year 15 with a negative cumulative cash flow of $634,686. So again, the guarantee is the difference in, in the years of their energy savings. And so the total, the goal is always to be net neutral at the end, but that is yet to be seen. So the measurement occurs and the guarantee of each year's saving is what their obligation is. And something okay. I'd add to this as well too is there are a lot of things that are predictions in this cash flow chart as well too. One of the predictions that we had to build into this is an interest rate of 2%. We don't know what that interest rate's ultimately gonna be. We're hoping for that to be better, which would decrease the payment. Another thing that we had to estimate is energy escalation rates. We estimated at 1.94%. That could also be higher or lower. Um, the operational savings is a number as well too that could also be higher or lower. And so these numbers, um, while they are projections, can vary to the positive and or to the negative. And that's something that we took into consideration when we were vetting these bids, um, that there is a degree of variability to these numbers. Also, the measurement and verification costs that you see in um, years one through five, those measurement and verification costs are something that we can control as well too, based on our degree of confidence after year one um, and our ability to measure and verify versus the company. So that's a contract that we can specify to either one, two, three, four, or five years in our negotiations, which would then 
impact the cumulative cash flows and a cascading effect as well, too. So, Brian, if we have um, about $4.8 million that goes out, okay, and we, if we take some of those measuring uh, dollars away that are in there, and we still have a negative $600,000 cash flow, what is the total cost to the district for this? Yet to be seen. So Brian explained to you all the fluctuating matters in that. So again, the guarantee is not the data that you just showed. The guarantee is they have to make up the energy savings that they guaranteed in it. So in 15 years, the risk you take as a board is, and the risk is there that a lot of items could change. Energy rates go up, they could go down. We get a good rate, rate of interest when we go. Net-net, um, it looks like the project would be within 600000 of paying for itself. Yet to be seen. We, do, we yeah. cannot predict the 15-year conditions out. So what, so what they've shown us is worst-case scenario. Correct. And Correct. based on, so I actually cranked through the NPV using their projected rates, and it's break-even after 13 years. So I, it's... So the bottom it's the line, difference between worst case scenario. Correct. And bottom line is, you hope to break even, and there's a pretty good chance of if it's not completely break even, you have financed a project at a very very low rate, an incredible rate to do, um, in the district that needs to be done anyway. Mm -hmm. Equipment's end of life. You cannot get the old building down next door until you separate the two buildings. Yeah. Their That's worst right. case scenario prediction has us breaking even um, right around year 17. Um, on this chart, and so as Mr. Roush pointed out, um, if we do a little bit better, then the years would definitely ascend and win. Um, our ability to break even on that would be. But there again, is not a guarantee there. The guarantee is they have to make up the difference in those correct. years of energy. Yeah, that's the guarantee part of these plans. Okay, so if the break even is in terms of uh, the numbers that Phil ran at thirteen. What comes in on the chart is around 17. Why wouldn't we take the other uh, contractor that bid this for $3 million plus profit and uh, plus principal and interest would be about $3.5 million or $3.485 million for a million dollar total cost less and so not and the same scope, Brad. So, of so you're not comparing apple to apple on this. $189,201 after 15 years being positive every single year throughout the whole entire duration of the 15 years being a net cumulative cash flow of positive. And then at the 20-year mark, Net cumulative cash flow of $2,170,659 in our pocket. I'll let Brian jump in. So you're, you're not comparing an identical car to identical car. So the, the other proposal is a less scope of a proposal than what we wanted. So two different projects. One's got more scope. Train did not bid it the, the way we requested it. And so go ahead, Brian. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll agree with what Mr. Sherrill is saying there. One of the dynamics of the RFP process for these guaranteed savings proposals is we give them um, what our basic project goals are. And our main project goal was that we did want replacement of the HVAC here um, in the administration center. We also did want to have LED lighting throughout the district. Um, we spent a significant amount of time with all three vendors throughout this process to help them understand what our needs were. And um, without going into great, great detail, the difference between um, the low bid and the bid that we chose was related to their ability to meet what our needs were within the scope of the work, specifically here at the administration center. So they do um, not move the boiler room, for example, in the building. And that is part of our proposal to place it in a different location in the building. There are several other little pieces that they left out of the proposal, of their proposal. That's correct. And so when those numbers are coming in, those numbers were leaving out some substantial needs that the districts had within completing the scope of the work um, that were not um, met within the scope of work that that vendor put before us. When you add so, those back in, 
it's pretty much a wash between the two dollar wise Brad yeah. and so um, site logic we thought had a more complete bid a more thorough bid and tried to meet the goals that we met they also their their job um, is a little more they stay in the district and help you with energy consumption um, use controls along the way where trains more of a mechanical company both good bids without a doubt but train left several things in and left those options out so another variant to discuss as well too is our anticipation of our projected rebates we're hoping that that rebate number that's projected at 211,000 can come in substantially higher as well too um, they build you a worst case scenario in those rebates um, but we are confident with the aggressiveness that site logic has presented to us in seeking those rebates um, that we will be able to perhaps bring in additional revenue there um, in addition to helping to earn some tax credits that may help offset that as well too and drive those revenues a also bit on the site logic proposal there is a 50 percent guarantee that they would share if they if they receive the award where they get a tax break so we're ineligible ineligible to receive that tax break if they receive that tax break they will they will share 50 percent of it so logic had that and train did not have that as well financially it, between the two proposals again it's a wash um, if you add into the other pieces that we re we requested to be in there that train didn't put in there so you're saying that they have a lack of scope of 1.2 million dollars the difference in cash flow between the two they and missed that, they missed the mark by 1.2 million in that ballpark correct wow. so there's a few things they left out of there in that ballpark So we believe we believe we're requesting the proposal for the best logical one and we did a lot of vetting there at FFO it was involved in that process mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. and again two good proposals good place to be in yeah I have, I have a, a question about flexibility of temperature control for like classrooms is are we um, uh, pigeonholed into uh, having a, a certain temperature in our classrooms or will we have flexibility to so you have policy you know, on that Pam that we run our controls and don't hold me to the number that says 68 to 70 or something and so that is what they use in that measure is our policy okay when I was um, looking at the data I appreciate all the uh, the work and, and the write-up that was uh, prepared for us in our board packet and the report. Um, one thing that I noticed um, when they shared um, uh, gas usage and electrical usage for all the buildings that they didn't have data for gas for Plymouth from September till November of 2018, I think it was. And so they, they used 2019 numbers. I might have those flipped. But um, I'm, I was just wondering if that was because I thought Northeast and, and Plymouth were tied together until um, the bond work happened and then they were separated. That's correct. The one meter at that time. Okay, so is that, that's probably why yes. um, they didn't have the numbers then? Is that yes. what I'm telling you? You're not able to break out the numbers when it was one meter for gross buildings. So, so then, uh, when when they do look at the numbers, um, they should use the same year of comparison for both Northeast and Plymouth, because uh, because they were broke apart. So instead of using Northeast one year when it included Plymouth two, and and then Plymouth a separate year where they were separate, it's it's not a it's good all, comparison. That's all so I would just included suggest in the looking at that. Yep. That's all in in the proposal. So the, it's a, yeah, the well, metrics what, the metrics are agreed upon in the proposal to determine the savings okay the metrics that are written in the report show that um, Plymouth and Northeast are compared their gas usage is compared on different years and all I'm saying is Northeast and Plymouth should compare on that same year yep. Yeah, we'll make sure when we um, negotiate the contract that we're making sure that those numbers are aligned. We'll, we'll double check, we'll revet, and make sure that they're in alignment with what the district wishes are. Okay. I love the proposal. I think this is a great way to move forward and, and, um, and do this project. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited about it and, and um, 
totally supportive. All right. Hey, Brian, one other thing for you in the packet that you gave us, which is the, just the three pager of the summary um, for the projected energy savings for the 15 years, you show site logic at the 4.883 million. Yes, sir. That's the 20 year total. Correct. They ran theirs out on a 20 year. Yes, correct. Okay, well then the other companies you're not using 20. I understand. So either make them 20 or make them 15, but you should use the so same. Train, so Train saw the, the other proposal and provided us a 20 year as well. So the original one was 15, um, but in the post bid, um, they provided 20. So we had 20 to 20 to compare them to, Brad. They did provide okay. them. You're saying in the chart that you have paper here? Yep. Yep, I understand your. Yeah, statement. that came in after in the post bid. They saw that so the site four, logic eight ran million out. 20. is really 3.4 million for the 15 year. I'd have to run those numbers to verify. Okay. Or if you use the 4.8 million, the other company would be 4.5 million. Okay. All right. We have a motion on the table by John, support by Phil. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have an action item 6.4. This is gifts totaling $106,000. We have two gifts to present to you tonight for your acceptance. Um, as Mr. McFarland stated, for $106,000 between the two. The first is the Midland High School and H.H. Dow High School Athletic Boosters, which have generously gifted us $6,000 for girls lacrosse uniforms. And the second is the Dow International has gifted us $100,000 toward the cost for the H.H. Dow High Turf Project. So we would appreciate your action to accept those gifts on behalf of Midland Public Schools tonight. Okay, I'll accept the motion. Make a motion to accept the gifts totaling $106,000 in item 6.4. Support. Motion by Phil, support by John. Any discussion regarding item 6.4? For the Dow High Turf, do they, these uh, funds that are all being collected are, I'm sure, pretty much all spent, Mike? Or is it? Yep, pretty much. But they're that pretty much spent as designed they had one change order i think it actually came uh through your company's recommendation uh if i remember so that was i think that was the one change order one change order for sixty six thousand dollars for the addition of berms so all paid for right now they have a uh, on mps site cash flow about three we hear that they may have another hundred over at the community foundation raised they're trying to get the 500 for lights and scoreboard that's that's what we're aware of at this point but turf is paid for and done. 300, about 300 cash left on hand. Okay. Will they ever need, how would we get water out there? I think we visited that one. Um, I'd have to go back and get that from you, but I believe we had our architect and Bart Mel take a look at that before the project commenced to make sure we were okay when that comes. So I'd have to go back and get you an answer on that one. Okay. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. Mr. Yes. Which, which John? I'm sorry, uh, Lauterbach. Okay. Lauterbach. I apologize, I wasn't clear on that. Uh, next up, item 6.5, Mr. Bruton. Thank you. This is just for information only tonight. Um, information that we are presenting five gifts totaling $5,211.14. Um, the first, the Midland High Booster Club for 4000 for Huddle, which is a digital video exchange platform. Two from the Viking Parent Association um, to help out with needs over at Northeast Middle School. Whitetails Unlimited helped us out with $500 for the Trap Club supplies. And finally, Garber Midland donated $500 to the Turf Project, and we certainly appreciate their generosity. We certainly do. Thank you very much. 
Um, next up, we have under human resources, item 7.1, Mr. Jaster. Thanks, Mr. McFarland. In memoriam, the board and staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of Mr. Kenneth R. Haneke. He passed away December 27, 2020. Uh, Kenneth was a plumber for the district and retired in 2002 after 30 years of service. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on, we are at item 8.1. These are letters to and from the Board of Education, and they are listed in the agenda and can be found there. Uh, next up, we have item 9.1. This is a list of our recently approved meeting dates for 2021. And that brings us to item number 10, study discussion. And at this point, um, if there are any points of clarification needed by a board member or if there is a topic that uh, would like further study, um, please speak up. Otherwise, I am going to turn the floor over to Mr. Sherrill for announcements. Okay, Mike, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, it is the Board Appreciation Month, and we appreciate all you do for us and the many committees we put you through and listening to us in our committee meetings and going through all the time and service. I think uh, sometimes those of you recently elected realize um, it's really a community service than it is more of a position, and we appreciate your service at that time. Um, as Brian explained, uh, our first revenue consensus is coming in January 15th, so you want to pay attention to that. It's kind of early, but we're going to get a good feel of the effect of COVID on the state. Um, there is originally a pretty pessimistic report that was coming, and we hear a little better report, but that doesn't mean um, uh, any increase in revenue at best. I think we can hope for maybe a flat revenue year next year, but we're so sales tax uh, dependent. And if you've uh, got to imagine COVID, it's probably decreased some sales tax from restaurants being closed, but also certainly low fuel prices also hurt us on sale tax, sales tax. So keep that in mind. Um, we are very excited to welcome our elementary students back to face-to-face -face instruction. A little over 200, I think, almost 300 students back on January 4th. Um, when our high school students return um, on January 19th, we'll welcome another two or 300 students back. So. Um, so far, so good, and I wrote to you about the exciting news of moving quickly on staff vaccinations with the health department. They'll be running their clinics on the 14th, 15th, and shot two on the 4th and 5th. Um, we got about 700 staff members presently signed up to receive those vaccinations. Um, the, the 14th, 15th will work well with PD and records day in, uh, combined around a weekend. The 4th and 5th lead into a weekend, but we would have school on that Friday, so we will hope to not have any side effects that puts anybody out for a day. Um, I think I heard one of the board members talk about somebody receiving the second shot. Sometimes that's a little, uh, little more rough on you, but if, according to the health department, the hospital who's out in the lead on the second shots has only had like one person not be able to work uh, and have to take a day off um, in there. So hopefully that does not pause anything. I don't really don't want to have to switch parents' calendars at this point and everything we've put through to get through that, that day. So um, the vac we, we probably could get more than the 680, 700 that we have as long as there's more vaccines coming. So we will si have to sign some staff up on a kind of a waiting list, um, the health department is um, waiting to see how many vaccines will show up. And also we are getting the Pfizer. Pfizer is at least five doses in a, in a, um, a vial, thank you for the word. Um, but you can get six and you're allowed to get six and they wanna be a little cautious if they're gonna get six out of every vial or not. So okay. that is all I have for you. All right, thank you, Mike. And that brings us to the end of our meeting. I will accept the motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Phil. Any support? Support. Support by Mr. Lauterbach. Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, folks, thank you very much. Have a great night. We Thank are you. adjourned. Thanks. Thanks.